Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day in New York. My name is Roger Downs, Conservation Director for the Sierra Club Atlantic Chapter, and I'll be your MC for the next half hour. This annual event for the planet is usually celebrated with tree plantings, beach cleanups, rallies, and public events. And in New York, Earth Day has often coincided with state lawmakers passing important pieces of environmental legislation. But clearly this year, all has been put on hold in the dire new context of COVID-19. In lieu of our traditional in-person lobby day at the Capitol, we thought that we could use this opportunity to virtually share some hope, reflect upon how far we've come from the first Earth Day, and talk about how we will face the daunting environmental challenges ahead of us. For the first uh, part of our program, we will have a distinguished panel of advocates. We'll discuss some recent victories in the New York State budget and the next steps to advance a $3 billion bond act, funding for environmental programs to combat climate change and how all these victories fit into an environmental justice context. After the first session, uh, we will have virtual meetings with Basil Sagos, DEC commissioner, and Amanda Lefton, the governor's first assistant secretary for the environment. Then Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Todd Kaminsky, and followed by Assembly Environmental Conservation Committee Chair Steve Engelbright. Throughout today's event, feel free to ask questions using the Q&A button. We won't be able to answer all of them verbally, but we will respond either during the webinar or afterwards. Between these sessions, We'll also share some additional video interviews. To coincide with today's events, uh, we are releasing a letter from over 100 organizations and 100 individuals urging our elected officials to maintain funding for key programs that benefit our environment, economy, and society. Specifically, the new Restore Mother Nature Bond Act, the Environmental Protection Fund, and the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Um, here today to discuss those programs and more is our panel. Uh, we have with us today Cecil Corbin Mark, direct, uh, Deputy Director of WE Act for Environmental Justice, Jessica Atni Mahar, Policy Director for the Nature Conservancy, Andy Bicking, Director of Public Policy for Cena Hudson, and Liz Moran, Policy Director for the New York Public uh, Interest Research Group. Um, to start our panel, uh, is Jessica Otney Mahar with the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Roger. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today, despite really tough circumstances this year. Our state leaders didn't forget how critical protecting our environment is. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this year's budget, including $300 million for the Environmental Protection Fund. Um, this was through really great leadership from environmental champions, including Governor Cuomo, Senate Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who will be with us shortly, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, and our environmental chairs, Senator Todd Kaminsky, and Assemblyman Stephen Engelbright, who will be here with us later today at this exciting event. And they've worked together to pass many important environmental bills um, while they've been chaired together over the last few years. We're also grateful to many other legislators who are with us today, um, either on this event or who recorded videos with us today, and who are with us when it comes time to vote in the legislature on important environmental issues, including the budget. The Environmental Protection Fund, which was created in 1993, 27 years ago, has grown from just about 30 million then to $300 million today. It protects clean water, clean air, and healthy food that New Yorkers depend on. It also provides open spaces to our communities, which are needed. Local parks, community gardens, public waterfronts, and hiking trails. And these are places that many of us are grateful to be spending time in these days. The EPF also creates jobs and contributes hundreds of millions of dollars to New York's economy. Some of our biggest employers are in sectors that depend on our natural resources, from outdoor recreation, to fishing and agriculture, 
to tourism and forestry. People don't often think that protecting nature is about jobs, but engineers, construction workers, and other trade workers are needed to restore natural areas and build parks and clean water projects. Investing in our environment is good for our well being and great for our economy. In fact, we have a study that shows for every dollar we invest in land and water protection through the Environmental Protection Fund, we get $7 back in taxpayer savings, revenue from things like tourism, services like clean water, and other benefits that these programs provide to our communities. So we wanted to start off today saying thank you very much to our legislative champions and to Governor Cuomo for continuing this critical investment in the state budget this year. Back to you, Roger. Thanks, Jess. Uh, and now we will hear from Scenic Hudson's Andy Bicking. Thanks very much, Roger. And uh, thank you also, Jessica, for that great description of the Environmental Protection Fund. It's so good to see so many friends and colleagues and advocates here online today. And I look forward to the time when we can be together again to uh, meet face to face and talk about many of the, the programs and ideas that we care so deeply about. I wanted to address the Environmental Bond Act of 2020. Uh, this November, voters in New York will have a once in a lifetime opportunity to address and combat the impact of climate change and damage to the environment by voting yes on the Environmental Bond Act of 2020. On behalf of my organization, Sina Hudson, and the statewide environmental community, thank you to Governor Cuomo and the state legislature for this strong and thoughtful proposal. The measure will authorize the state to spend $3 billion to fund environmental protection, natural restoration, climate protection, and clean energy projects. And these investments are critical in order to protect our communities and ensure that our children and grandchildren are afforded the same or better opportunities than we have had. Staying safe and securing public health is rightly the top priority for our state elected leaders at this moment. We thank them for their service. Yet when the pandemic is under control, we will still need to ensure clean drinking water supplies, protected farms that supply us with fresh food, buildings that are clean, safe, and efficient, parks and community gardens that make our cities, towns, and villages better places to live, and measures that protect us from heat waves and severe flooding and storms, which are unfortunately becoming more common. This measure is something we can take pride in in a lot of different ways, not only what it will invest in, but we know that this investment will benefit all New Yorkers because the law actually requires that 35% of the funds be spent in communities that have experienced a disproportionate environmental impact, environmental justice communities. We can also take pride in knowing that this measure will be transparent Annual reporting on spending from the Bond Act is required by law so the public will know the impact that their investment is having in their local community. The Environmental Bond Act of 2020 will address the predominant environmental concerns of our time. And as we have learned through studying the impact of the Environmental Protection Fund, which Jessica mentioned, these strategies also have a positive economic benefit and create jobs. So the Bond Act if passed, will be important to supporting the state's recovery. So thank you again to our governor and to our legislators for their uh, proposal that they've put before voters in November. And voters out there, uh, we hope you'll do the right thing at the ballot box. Thanks so much, Andy. Uh, now we're gonna hear from Nyperg's uh, Liz Moran. Great. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, my name is Liz Moran and I am the Environmental Policy Director uh, for NYPERC, the New York Public Interest Research Group. Um, as we come together today for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we're finding ourselves in a particularly scary time um, that's highlighted the stark need for us to invest in our environment to make sure everybody has access to clean air, water, um, and a safe environment that protects public health particularly dire right now is the need for access to clean water. Hand washing in particular is essential to prevent spread of this illness. Uh, so the need for water funding was crucial well before this crisis and thankfully 
New York State has made tremendous progress in terms of investing in clean water infrastructure. In 2015, we first created the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act, and in 2017, we now have the Clean Water Infrastructure Act, um, which has now become a $3.5 billion program to invest in a huge swath of in clean water needs from our hard water infrastructure, the pipes that bring us clean water to our homes um, and take away our um, uh, wastewater. It also invents, uh, invests in protecting us from harmful algal blooms um, and is crucial in investing in protecting us from emerging contaminants and so much more. Um, and this program is so essential because our needs are tremendous. It's been estimated that over the next 20 years, we're going to need to invest $80 billion in uh, wastewater and drinking water infrastructure alone. And that doesn't include a number of the other programs that are funded by the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. All of these needs are being exacerbated by the climate crisis. Um, so the good news is we have come a long way. We were thrilled that the governor and the legislature came together and committed a new 500 million to the Clean Water Infrastructure Act. Um, this is so critical that we maintain this funding, especially in this crisis, because the folks that are working in our drinking water and wastewater facilities are working overtime right now to make sure that we continue to get our clean water um, and that our wastewater is taken away safely. So we've come a long way, but we have to keep building and make sure that this program is maintained for years to come um, and to make sure that all New Yorkers have access to clean water right now. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, and to conclude this panel, we have Cecil Corbin Mark from We Act for Environmental Justice. Cecil. Thank you, Roger. And thank you to Jessica, Andy, and Liz. And happy Earth Day to all of you who are out there. Uh, I put on my green bow tie for you, so I'm falling behind Andy with the bow tie theme. Um, I just want to uh, say thank you to uh, everyone who's joined us today. And to start by letting you know that um, I, my uh, co-panelists have really highlighted some of the key issues for how New York continues to lead on the environment. And I want to also start out by acknowledging and thanking uh, the legislature, uh, led by Stu Leader Stuart Cousins, as well as uh, Speaker uh, Carl Hasty, and also, most of all, the governor for his real leadership in helping advance some of these issues. I want to start my comments by saying that, uh, by sharing with you a quote from Nelson Mandela, who's one of my heroes. Uh, the quote goes, I shall fight the government side by side with you, inch by inch and mile by mile mile until victory is won. What are you going to do? Will you come along with us or are you going to co-create with the government or cooperate, sorry, with the government in its efforts to suppress the claims and aspirations of your own people? Or are you going to remain silent and neutral in a matter of life and death to my people, to our people? For my own part, I have made my choice. I will not leave South Africa, nor will I surrender. Only through hardship, sacrifice, and militant action can freedom be won. The struggle is my life. I will continue to fight for freedom until the end of my days. Those are the words of Nelson Mandela in June of 1961. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, I'm inspired by Nelson Mandela's choice to make the struggle his life. Former president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela's fight in 1961 was to make South Africa a more just society that valued the lives of every South African, especially black, colored, and Indian South Africans by vanquishing the system of apartheid. Today, our fight to protect the environment must center not only the reduction of greenhouse gases, pounds of pollutants removed from our waters, or BTUs reduced for greater energy efficiency, Instead, we must also center the elimination of health and economic disparities and unequal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations in communities of color. As a leader, former President Mandela recognized that a, a diversity of perspectives was essential to transformational leadership in his beloved South Africa. 
To that end, when he finally became president, he brought into leadership not only diverse races, but even former leaders in the old apartheid regime alongside leaders from the infamous South African townships. On this 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we in New York environmental movement need to heed and implement Mandela's transformational leadership style of incorporating the voices of those most impacted by health and economic disparities in designing the policy and practical solutions for climate, water quality, solid waste, energy, etc. The fight to protect our environment must be for a more just society that values the lives of all New Yorkers especially people of color and low-income white folk, by advancing policies that contribute to the vanquishing of the health and economic disparities that create unequal and separate New Yorks. In short, we must be one New York that fights for environmental justice. Why should we do this? You might find yourself asking, well, you need to look no further than the current realities of the COVID-19 crisis. EJ communities are the frontline communities. And as their fate goes, so the fate of the rest of New York goes. How do you do this, you might ask? Well, one, we need to celebrate our incredible leadership here in New York State on environmental policies. Our leaders, uh, especially under Governor Cuomo and leader Stuart Cousins and Speaker Hastie, have passed groundbreaking legislation and signed that into law with the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act. We've passed in our budget uh, an environmental protection fund that values and uplifts environmental justice communities by set setting aside dedicated funding for those communities to build capacity to do the things that are necessary to protect those communities from environmental injustice. We've made sure that the Bond Act uh, has its sights squarely set on lifting up uh, communities and taking leadership from communities. Those are words that came directly from Governor Cuomo's mouth at a meeting that I personally attended, and I want to applaud him for recognizing that. While we can also lay claim to many other environmental victories in New York State, like signing, uh, like, sorry, sorry, like passing an acid rain law here, one of the first in, nation, in the nation to do so, like passing the Child Safe Products Act, uh, one of the strongest in, the strongest in the nation. Um, we also have to recognize that there are undeniable truths for too many uh, communities in New York. Air pollution is not distributed randomly. It is concentrated in communities with high concentration of black and brown people or low income white folk. And what that means is that communities like East Harlem El Barrio and East and West sides of Buffalo, both communities of colors are among the state's highest with asthma rates and incidents and hospitalizations. This is a key trigger for contributing to the, uh, the poor quality of life and the premature death that those communities can sometimes experience. It's also a contributor to their high incidence of being infected by the COVID-19 uh, virus. Our environmental policies must, moving forward, as recognition of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, move to recognize that our fight is one that has to uplift these communities first and frontline and foremost. Our fight has to be one, as I said earlier, that's not just about reducing greenhouse gases or BTUs for energy efficiency or removing pounds of pollutants from our water, but it must, it must advance the uh, uh, a vanquishing fight for, uh, a fight to vanquish, sorry, the economic uh, and uh, health disparities that these communities are advancing. We can celebrate our victories, but we must look to uh, an environmental movement that is partnering effectively with environmental justice communities. We must look to a movement that figures out how uh, our resources are shared in equitable ways to make sure that we are strong. We are one ecosystem fighting off all of the invaders that make our communities unhealthy, unwell, and environmentally unjust. And with that, I just wanna lift up our New York leaders for their continued leadership. But in the environmental movement, we as leaders have to step up and continue to push them forward. This change will not happen without change amongst ourselves as well. So I applaud what we've done in the last legislative session. I applaud the governor for his leadership on the Environmental Bond Act. I'm applauding the governor for the EPF, uh, but we are all in this together and we must be one New York that fights for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Cecil, that, that was wonderful. Um, now we will take uh, questions from reporters and uh, Bobby Wilding from Clean and Healthy New York uh, will facilitate this portion. So take it away, Bobby. Thank you, Roger. 
Um, I am now looking and invite um, any of our um, registered reporters to see if you have any questions for our panel. You can let me know by sending a chat directly to me or to our panel. And so Pat's question uh, to the panelists is, um, during the pandemic, the Trump administration has been rolling back even more environmental regulations. Uh, what are the ones that you're most concerned about and what are the regional implications? I'm going to um, see if any of our panelists want to unmute themselves to offer a reflection on that. Well, you know, I, I th this is Roger Downs, Sierra Club Atlantic chapter. I mean, I, I think that we, you know, currently these rollbacks, a lot of them are in memo form, but, you know, we, we really have to see how they're actionable in New York. Um, but we are very concerned about the Clean Air Act uh, and the the uh, emissions that are being relaxed. Um, you know, in New York, we have a Norlite facility that is burning firefighting foam, um, and that there is legislation and there, there is legislation pending that would ban the burning of that foam. Um, and we're concerned that that, that could move forward. Uh, certainly, we're concerned about the relaxing of transportation standards. Uh, uh, standards uh, to administer the Clean Water Act and protect wetlands. Um, this is all something that we're going to have to monitor, uh, certainly during this crisis, uh, because, you know, as, as was mentioned before by other panelists, there is a deep connection between public health and, and all these uh, environmental rollbacks, uh, and that, you know, uh, folks will fare better with the COVID crisis uh, when there is clean air, um, certainly. Bobby, this is Cecil. I'll, I'll join in and respond to that question and say that um, this pandemic that we're experiencing, uh, obviously, as I discussed and others know, uh, preys upon people with pre-existing respiratory illnesses in the worst way. Um, one of the worst things that we could be doing is creating any kind of rollback that says we don't need uh, air quality enforcement. The communities that are suffering some of the worst air pollution are those communities on the front lines. So the very people that, you know, have to go to the hospitals to be the nurses or be the uh, bus driver that takes people to work uh, are also going home to communities where air quality is the worst. And that makes them more susceptible to being uh, infected by the virus. And their outcomes are worse because of those kinds of uh, uh, realities. And so this is not the time for us to be rolling back uh, environmental uh, regulations at all. It's the worst thing that the Trump administration could do when you just thought that there could be no worse that they could do. Pat, this is Andy Bicking from Cena Cutson, and just to build on what Roger and Cecil said, which I think is, is really on the mark, um, it's probably obvious to everyone listening today, but it deserves to be said for the record that New York has been on the forefront of environmental protection for generations. We uh, started with the whole idea of citizen standing with the fight to save Storm King Mountain in 1963 that opened up the first case law on the environment in the country. We've created the constitutionally protected Adirondack Park and the Catskill watershed. Uh, some of those areas are enshrined in the Constitution. We've passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, groundbreaking legislation nationally, if not internationally, for affording uh, protections to communities of all kinds throughout the state. Uh, so it's very important that we continue to monitor the environmental rollbacks from the Trump administration. And it's really incumbent on all of us as advocates as journalists and as legislators to uh, monitor that situation closely and make sure that we're putting the right safeguards in place to ensure that those impacts are minimized for New Yorkers. Thanks. So we're going to need to move on now to our next panel. So I'm going to play a brief clip from uh, Tom Jorling while we move our panel up. Tom, as I said, Tom Jorling is a former DEC commissioner and uh, he's going to reflect on uh, the first Earth Day. So one second. Could you please tell our viewer about your experience on the first Earth Day and describe its significance? Yes, uh, the first Earth Day in April of, of 1970 occurred at a time when uh, the committee of the U.S. Senate that I was 
on the staff of uh, was deeply immersed in in working on environmental legislation, the Water Quality Improvement Act dealing with oil spills and and what became the Clean Air Act of, of 1970. Um, the members of this of the committee were deeply involved in the preparation and organization of of Earth Day and they became active participants in it. So we now have our uh, next panel up and uh, so if uh, you, uh, 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 Andy and Kathy and Basil can turn on your videos. Um, I just want to very briefly uh, reintroduce our panel and then also introduce, uh, we have with us today, uh, Basil Sagos, who is the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation and uh, former Deputy Secretary for the Environment. Thank you so much for joining us. And he's going to be talking with Kathy Curtis, Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York, Cecil Corbin Mark, Deputy Director of We Act for Environmental Justice, and Andy Bicking, uh, the Director of Public Policy for Scenic Hudson. Thanks, everyone. Take it away. Hey, Basil. Uh, I just first want to thank the governor and you so much for such an amazing budget in such a tough budget year. Uh, not only did uh, the state codify the governor's fracking ban, but they made sty the styrofoam food, uh, single use food packaging uh, ban statewide and included uh, the packing peanuts as well. And not to mention retaining funding for the Environmental Protection Fund and Drinking Water Infrastructure and uh, the Environmental Quality Bond Act, the Restore Mother Nature Bond Act. Uh, and now we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, uh, which is a huge benchmark. And uh, simultaneously, the DEC is celebrating their 50th anniversary. And uh, it, the agency has certainly grown and changed a lot over the last 50 years. Um, and for the last decade or so, between your position as Deputy Secretary for the Environment in the Executive Chamber and now as the Commissioner of Environmental Conservation, uh, the governor and you have been leading uh, New York's national environmental health leadership in many respects. Uh, so the EPF, for example, uh, has, so much of an impact and our organization in particular is uh, focused on the environmental health aspects of it that have both been retained and grown over you know the last I believe Jeff just said 27 years there's been an environmental uh, protection fund including the the pollution prevention uh, unit which Institute which uh, actually helps companies pollute less. So it's a very solution oriented and positive uh, impact it has on New York's environment. And the our New York's participation in the Interstate Chemicals Clearing House, which is going to be really useful as more disclosure policies come online uh, over the years. And the uh, Children's Environmental Health Centers of Excellence that are enabling pediatricians to appropriately treat and manage children's uh, diseases and disorders of environmental impact. So thank you so much for all of those things. Um, so I wonder what, of what are you most proud though? We've, I've talked about what we're super thrilled about, but what are you most proud of uh, in terms of yours and the governor's and the state's accomplishments? Um, and how is DEC celebrating their 50th anniversary, I think uh, viewers and listeners would want to know what they can plug into that the DEC has planned. And also, what, what's next? What's, uh, what's on the docket? What do, you, what do you plan to do next to build on all of those enormous successes and progress? Well, well hi, everybody, and Kathy. Great to see you. Um, I wish we could be together in person right now. I wish I could see all of you in person. Happy Earth Day. Happy 50th Earth Day. Happy birthday, DEC, 50 years. Great to see my predecessor, Tom Jorling, who I actually pass every day in the hallway here. We have every, every DEC commissioner on, on the wall. It's important to, <clears throat> to remember our history, you know, 50 years of amazing history at this agency. 
and 50 years of working with, with uh, the environmental community in, in turning this state around from what it was back in 1970. Uh, hard to imagine those days of polluted rivers and uh, smog in New York City and, um, and you get on the list of, of what the state must have looked like back then and how far we've come. Um, it is remarkable. Um, it's been a remarkable month, to say the least. Uh, the fact that we're, we're on um, Zoom right now doing this as opposed to in, in person together. I mean, what a sea change in, in the world. Um, you know, the most dramatic um, an earth shattering event that we've been a part of um, collectively as, as, a, as a civilization in, in, a, in a long time. Um, so to have Earth Day come in the middle of it, um, I think is, is, um, uh, is an opportunity for us to, to gauge how we've done, um, but also to, um, to look ahead to, to the future, right? Our 50 year anniversary is a good 50 year anniversary, but it's also, <clears throat> are we setting ourselves up as a state for success over, 50, over the next 50 years? And, um, and I, I, I will just say over the last month, you asked me what I'm most proud of. It's in seeing DC staff um, outside of their comfort zone and succeeding with their mission. I, I, I say that because um, I'm, I'm, I am most proud of, of, of my role and do their job on the front lines of the, of the coronavirus response under the governor's leadership. Um, setting up testing sites, you know, where we had a thousand people drive through in a, in a day um, to be to be tested for coronavirus. Uh, the alternate care facilities, these hospitals, standing those up, um, seeing the staff float in, in and out of of these incredibly challenging environments and bring their expertise to bear on this problem, uh, whether it's rangers or law enforcement or spill staff or regional directors. Um, I mean, we've had hundreds of staff involved. And it's a bit like the response to Hoosick Falls a few years ago when we had 600 DEC staff in Hoosick Falls helping to restore that, 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 that water supply very quickly. Um, so I, in, in my mind, um, I'm just most proud of, of my staff always stepping up here. And they've been doing it for 50 years. You've, you've been there uh, seeing some of, the, some of the progress over that time. Um, you know all of our staff. You, you know the, how dedicated they are day in and day out. Uh, to this state and um, and being on being the front lines of public service that that certainly is is in my view uh, what makes this job so meaningful to me um, you know where do we go next I think we are taking it day to day right right now um, you know this is my first full full week back in the office after basically four and a half five weeks uh, out in the field on corona um, you know the governor's you know, 58 days straight on this um, I think we are very well positioned as a state to, to do big things, but we are, we are taking it day to day right now. And uh, we know the big challenges ahead of us, climate change, water, um, and, um, and all of the, the contamination issues that we're, we've been dealing with. Um, but uh, um, you know, I wanna thank you for, for all your partnership over the years, your friendship. Uh, we've accomplished a great deal together. Um, we have so much more to do, so buckle up. I guess I will uh, jump in here and just say, hey, Basil, it's so great to see you, man. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you are healthy and that you're, um, uh, I hope your family is doing well uh, under these really trying times and must applaud you guys for the leadership of both the governor and the agency uh, during this COVID-19 crisis and epidemic. I wanna focus a little bit on uh, some of what I brought up at the outset of this uh, uh, 50th anniversary Earth Day event, really focusing a little bit more in on environmental justice. Clearly, uh, the COVID-19 situation has exposed a lot of uh, the real challenges in terms of both uh, health and economic disparities in our state. Um, and this is not just unique to New York, obviously, it's across the entire country. Um, in the time that uh, Governor Cuomo has been in office and uh, you standing by his side, both as deputy secretary uh, and then now as DEC commissioner under both of your 
leadership and work, uh, you all have elevated the voices of environmental justice communities in policy discussions. Um, I think that while that has been really wonderful, um, in 2019, the legislative session of the legislature passed and the governor signed into law a bill that establishes in law a permanent environmental justice advisory body that engages all state agencies in thinking about developing and implementing policies that advance environmental justice statewide. How will, particularly in the face of this DEC, uh, how will, sorry, in the face of the COVID-19 situation, and then moving beyond, because we will get beyond this, as the governor has very rightly told us, how will DEC and other state agencies change uh, their performance evaluation or management or allocation of resources to make sure that real progress is made on advancing environmental justice statewide in light of the passage of this legislation and now signed into law? Right. Well, great question. Um, I mean, look, I think a lot has to change, right? Uh, uh, we already knew that in, in a way, we in the environmental community. Um, have been speaking about this for years, the disproportionate impact uh, um, of pollution in, in disadvantaged communities, um, the impact on health uh, from that. Um, I mean, now you're seeing it front and center. You're seeing it front and center in, in a terrible way. Um, and uh, it underscores the importance of the work that we already have collectively underway. Um, I mean, look, we're, we are going to have to completely rewrite how we do work uh, as a state, um, how, we, um, how we prioritize our projects, uh, not just our projects, but in the private sector as well, um, to take into account the, uh, uh, the burdens uh, sustained by, by communities all across the state um, that, that have been uh, over the years left behind. Um, Thankfully, now we have legislation to back that up. We have a charge from the legislature to carry out uh, and develop a plan uh, for the future. Um, we've got now uh, bodies that are being created to, to uh, hold our feet to the fire, to, to work with us, to develop that plan uh, jointly, building really off of the work that, that you, we act and, and all of your colleagues have done over the years. And, um, and, and really put the state into a better place. We, we, we can't envision a future where we address climate change or clean water or you name the issue if we're not looking to, to elevate every single community at the same time. That's the, that's the brilliance of the Climate Leadership Act. That's the brilliance of the laws passed last year that the governor signed into law um, it, that, that we, are, we are now advancing uh, a holistic approach to to uh, to these communities and to the entire state. So that's something it, as, as we pull out of COVID and start to work um, uh, back on our core mission, that's something we're going to be working on very aggressively this year. And uh, I'm excited to be, uh, to be at the table with you on that. Basil, thank you uh, for your time, Commissioner, and, and thank you also for your service on the front lines of the pandemic. Um, and thank you to you and the governor for your great work on the Bond Act. I had um, two questions for you today. One related to the Climate Leadership and uh, Protection Act, the second related to the Bond Act itself. Uh, the first question related to the new climate law is, and we all understand there's been a, a delay and a number of uh, state programs due to the pandemic response, but do you have a sense about when the Climate Action Council will be convened and when New Yorkers can expect uh, the beginning of the conversation, which you were just chatting about with Cecil. Uh, and second, uh, related to the Bond Act, um, you know, the, the programs included are really remarkable and groundbreaking for what they can do to help our communities fight climate change. I'm wondering what strategy uh, you at the DEC and your other commissioners at Ag and Markets, Department of State, um, what strategies are you really most excited about to put into play to help protect our communities against flooding and storm surges, as mm -hmm. well as um, uh, you know uh, uh, heat waves in our urban communities? Right. Well, great, great questions, Andy. First of all, on on the timing of when we get back to business on on the Climate Leadership Act, um, CLCPA. I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? It feels like a million years ago that we had our first meeting. 
Um, I remember Dr. Zucker stood up from that meeting, and had to walk out because of uh, because of uh, where we are in coronavirus. And here we are now, you know, 50 days later, um, going through the same thing. Um, the climate, nonetheless, is is still changing. So it, my view is, as soon as we can we can get back together, we will. Um, and and put no one at risk, no one at jeopardy. The governor expects that of us. Um, expects this to be uh, notwithstanding everything we've gone through. Expects us to to be on track this year to meet our obligations under the law. And he mentioned that today. He mentioned his uh, it, during during his remarks today the importance of of climate change uh, action um, because it is the defining issue of our time. So so we'll get back to that as quickly as we can. Um, as to the Bond Act. The essence of the Bond Act is to, it's the other, other side of the CLCPA in a way, it's to prepare the state for the new normal. Uh, flooding, sea level rise, um, uh, you know, droughts even. Um, how do you protect the state in, in a way? How, how do you get multiple benefits uh, from every dollar invested in, in the landscape, be it flood protection, habitat improvements, or recreation, or other economic benefits? So. Um, it, it's an exciting uh, tool, hopefully, that we'll have at our disposal if the, if the voters uh, are, are given a chance to weigh in on it and say yes. Um, and we'll be working very closely, uh, all of the commissioners, um, we're already at the table uh, talking about this um, uh, as recently as a, a few weeks ago, uh, on how to carry this, this forward, how to communicate this out to the public, the benefits of the Bond Act. And um, and then ultimately, you know how to how to spend those dollars wisely so that we're saving money over the long term, um, based upon the amount of damage that, that no action uh, could could bring us as a state. Thank you so much, and um, best of luck in everything in your future plans. Thank you, Andy. Thank you so much to everyone, especially to uh, to you, um, Commissioner, for joining us. And we are going to move on from this panel. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, and so just to let us make that transmission, I'm now going to um, share a short video conversation with Senator Serrano. I'm also really excited about uh, our commitment to the Restore Mother Nature Act. Um, this is one of those investments that I believe will pay dividends for many, many years to come and for generations to come. And I'm glad that even though we're in really tough financial straits right now, that we're not backing away from our commitment uh, to this really important uh, environmental policy and public health policy I think the Restore Mother Nature Act will go a long ways to ensuring uh, that we can maintain our environmental world, that we, we can maintain the resiliency and grow the resiliency that we need in our community. I'm also excited about some bits of legislation that I've been working on, uh, namely environmental impact zones. I hope to get that passed this year through remote session. That would be great if we can get that done. It will help demystify a lot of the discussion about which communities have bore the brunt of bad policy when it comes to pollution. All right. Uh, uh, so now we are uh, ready to move on with our next discussion. Um, one moment. And uh, before we begin our panel, um, Roger, do you want to... Um, give us our introduction that we've been waiting for. Um, it is a tremendous honor to have Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins join us on this virtual Earth Day, and it's my honor to introduce her. Andrea Stewart-Cousins has been widely recognized as a trailblazer in local and state government and a champion for progressive action. In 2012, she became not only the first African-American woman but the first woman to lead a New York State legislative conference. In 2019, she shattered the glass ceiling again when her peers elected her as temporary president and majority leader uh, of the state Senate. Majority Leader Stuart Cousins oversaw passage of the most comprehensive and aggressive climate change legislation in the nation, as well as historic and transformative legislation 
on issues including voting reforms, gun safety, women's rights, health care reform, protecting immigrants and dreamers, securing tenants protections and affordable housing, LGBTQ rights, reforming the justice system, and addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. Before her election to the state Senate in 2006, she served as a Westchester County legislator. Before elected office, Andrea Stewart Cousins was the first African American to serve as director of community affairs for the city of Yonkers. Prior to entering public service, Andrea Stewart Cousins worked in a variety of professions, including customer service, sales and marketing with New York Telephone and AT&T, as a journalist and as a teacher uh, for Yonkers Public Schools. Majority Leader Stuart Cousins, we are honored you can join us on this 50th Earth Day. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And is she not here? Nope, she's I'm here. here. Oh, there you are. Welcome. Hey, hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much. And it's so good to be part of the celebration. I am... Um, you know, listening to the introduction and remembering those days way back when, when I was begging for people to give uh, me a chance. I had no idea really then how much was at stake. And certainly in terms of climate and how we in the state legislature could make all the difference for not only the residents of New York, but to protect to, to actually present real leadership on an issue that impacts every single person on the planet. So I really am so happy to be here and to share this day with you, uh, to hear so many of you in the activism community, in the activist community, and with all of your great organizations, how you are absolutely, I apologize, absolutely committed to making sure that you continue to not only elect but support and to to galvanize uh not only we who are in these positions but the community to understand what's at stake and so our senate majority which you know was very very hard to come by took full advantage of our ability to really start doing the things that you've been begging us to do for so many years. Simple things like making sure that we don't have toxic toys. I mean, year after year, we were getting to the brink, and I know Cecil remembers, we were getting to the brink of being able to pass this legislation and yet not being able to do it. And having, uh, just marking the Earth Day with a resolution that very, very grudgingly was put forward uh, by a majority at that time who didn't really understand why this all mattered. So we're in a position now where we can lead, and I know you're gonna be hearing from Senator Kaminsky, I saw that you just heard from, from Senator Serrano, and so many of my great Senate legislative uh, leaders and certainly Senator Kaminsky as chair of the Environmental Committee, as we, as we push forward on the things that we know matter. And we talked about the bond, and I know when I, you know, now that I'm one of the people in the room, you get a chance to sit at that table, and there was a question in this, in, in this economic environment, do we still go forward with our, our Restore Mother Nature Bond Act? And there was no question that we had to go forward with. We've had to show people that we have a commitment to our future, to all of our future, to the future of this great planet. And we wanted to make sure that that message was sent very, very loud and very, very clear. So to all of you, happy Earth Day. Thank you for letting me be part of this. Thank you for recognizing my extraordinary group of senators who understand every single day, and it'll be, again, exemplified by uh, uh, what uh, Senator Kaminsky will, will bring to this conversation. Thank you for, for believing in us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to lead. And again, hopefully everybody now understands the importance of state legislatures, because when you're in an environment where on a federal level, there seems to be a lack of understanding and even rollbacks, 
who is in charge in the state matters. So when we get past this, this uh, you know, terrible period that we're in, and again, I want to certainly say to anyone who, and everyone, frankly, who's not only been impacted, but I know uh, have lost people, you know, our, our condolences. And, you know, you have our commitment that when we, we come back, we continue to work on all of the issues that matter, including environmental justice, so that we can see, again, a future that is not only worthy of, of the people, but worthy of the planet that has been so good to us. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you thank so you much, so George much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, oh, Roger. Yeah, please take it. All right. Thank you so much, to, uh, uh, Leader, for uh, taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. And um, we're gonna now move on to our next panel. And um, so here we go. We're going to have uh, our uh, Senator Todd Kaminsky, who's the Environmental Conservation Committee Chair. We'll have uh, him, he'll be talking with Jeremy Cherson, the Legislative Advocacy Manager for Riverkeeper, Karen Miller, Founder and President of Huntington Breast Cancer Action Coalition, and Patrick McClellan, the New York State Policy Director of the New York State League of Conservation Voters. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Cherson. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you, uh, Leader Cousins. Uh, those were very inspiring words. Um, and yes, we do all know how important it is to have good state leadership. And I'm really honored today to be joined by Senator Todd Kaminsky, who, for those of you who don't know, uh, is the chair, chairman of the Environmental Conservation Committee in the state Senate, and has done more for the environment as the chair for a year and a half than many chairs in state legislatures around the country do in their entire tenure. Thank you very much for joining us, Senator. Thanks for having me. So uh, we're gonna run, the, those of us on the line are gonna run, run down a minute each uh, on three items that are critically important to our organizations and communities across the state. And I'm gonna kick it off with the Water Infrastructure Act. Can, I just, ask, can I just ask if Pat has a mustache? I, I do, it's a quarantine mustache. All right, very good, good work. He's got to make the mask fit right. Um, so we're going to kick off with, the, with one minute on each, each topic, uh, and then we'll break out into, into a discussion. So uh, I'm going to kick it off with uh, uh, the Clean Water Infrastructure Act, which since uh, 2015 has, invest, has allocated over $3 billion uh, to clean water projects, both wastewater and drinking water. And so uh, between 2015 and 2018, over $700 million was pushed out the door, given to communities. Uh, workers worked on critical projects such as uh, upgrading treatment plants, uh, raising um, uh, uh, treatment plants out of harm's way of sea level rise, fixing pipes, uh, removing lead uh, service lines. Uh, and in the two years uh, since 2018, many millions more has come out the door. And Nassau County, Senator Kaminsky's uh, county, which he represents part of, has received upwards of $30 million in grants from the water infrastructure program alone. And, but even, even with those grants, uh, Na uh, Nassau County has 10 to $30 million worth of unawarded shovel-ready projects. And that's on par with Westchester County, Orange County, and Erie County. We also know that this infrastructure program that the, the Senate and Assembly approved uh, creates jobs. 20,000 jobs in 2019 alone were created from this act. And $11 of each uh, dollar spent on water infrastructure yields two and a half dollars in economic output in other industries. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat uh, to talk about the Bond Act. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so the the Environmental Bond Act that was included in the budget this year, uh, three billion dollars, is a, a really big deal. It's the first Environmental Bond Act in uh, 
close to 20 years, more than 20 years, I think. Um, and, you know, with this Bond Act, something that we're really excited about is that it's focused on climate change and on resiliency. And so, Senator, I was hoping that you could speak to uh, the challenges that New York uh, faces dealing with more intense flooding and rising sea levels. Per, you know, certainly that's an issue in, in your district. And if you could speak to how this Bond Act is going to help us uh, prepare for those issues. Sure, Pat. I just want to say that I think it's very appropriate for you to have so much alcohol so close at hand to where you're sitting. You need to have a bar within reach of your workstation. And I think you're illustrating that perfectly well. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, want to, I want to just say generally that the two, um, the two issues that Jeremy and Pat raised are connected. And we wanted to make sure that water infrastructure projects got into the Bond Act because there is such an overwhelming need um, for them. So on Long Island, we're also dealing with um, contaminants like 1,4-Dioxane that we never had dealt with before, that a few years ago, people wouldn't have even known their names. And the cost, cost of treatment is exorbitant. And a lot of the Bond Act money, excuse me, a lot of the um, money from the EPF uh, had been going toward, and rightfully so, toward fixing those issues. But, you know, we're an old state. We're one of the original 13 colonies. Our infrastructure is very old. Where I live in Long Beach, the water tower is 99 years old and needs to be replaced. Uh, so um, there's not enough money right now to do all the important infrastructure projects we need, plus treat the uh, contaminants uh, going forward. So making sure that the Bond Act could also cover um, general water infrastructure projects like sewering and um, you know general was very important but resiliency is also very very important i come from a place that superstorm sandy totally devastated almost every part of my district was impacted and um, we want to make sure that whether it's a program to you know return land to nature whether it's a program to help build natural marshland to hold back floods or even put in artificial structures to prevent flooding, it's extremely important. Uh, we know that even if we do the best we can to fight climate change and put in the most aggressive programs, we are going to be having more severe weather. And frankly, spending now makes a lot more sense than spending later when you can, uh, when it costs a lot more to clean up the damage. And of course, right now with our economy stuck where it is, any projects that can get people working and get our economy moving and help put money in the economy while also making our planet better is, is just, you know, I, I know people don't like this term and I don't throw it around either, but it's a win-win-win. It's a total win all, all the way around. So I, I'm really proud of what we're able to do. I hope the Bond Act sticks. And if we get to a point by midsummer where we think this is going to be on the ballot, which I hope it will be, we're all going to have to work together to make it happen. We're in a very uncertain time. There may be mail-in ballots for all we know. Um, and it'll be a very contentious presidential election one way or the other. We've got to get it passed. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, that's, that's, all, that's all true. We face enormous challenges. We're an incredibly old, old state. Our infrastructure is old. Here in the, the Hudson Valley, around 10% of our wastewater treatment plants are newer or at capacity, and uh, almost half of our sewer lines are over 60 years old. And so people on the line can imagine what a 60, I mean, maybe you don't want to imagine what a 60-year-old sewer line is like, but it's not good. And the, the money we spend to, to, get, to get workers pulling out those pipes, putting in new infrastructure, is that win-win situation where we're creating jobs, we're funding communities, uh, and we're creating more resilient infrastructure because the stuff we're putting in the ground is going to last longer than the original. Our, our local governments are going to be without revenue for the most part. part. Year. It's going to be very hard for our local government. Knowing that the EPF money is going to be there is critically important. It's going to be more important than ever, for sure, because they're not going to be able to do many of these projects on their own. Yeah, and I'm going to get to Karen. Um, you know, the, the EPF is an incredibly important program, and not only does it fund these critical, you know, in, in, very environmental in terms of wildlife type programs, it also funds very important environmental health initiatives that I'm um, hoping, Karen, you're on the line, you can speak to. Uh, yep, yeah, am I off mute? You're good. Very good. So thank you, Senator and Jeremy, and everybody who's put together this uh, meeting today. 
Um, hello, uh, Todd Kaminsky. I'm the founder of Huntington Breast Cancer Action Coalition and a representative of the New York State Children's Environmental Health Centers. We are a part of the Long Island region and we call, uh, and we lovingly call these New York centers Nice Check. Um, and it's so great to virtually be able to uh, meet with you. And hopefully within the next month or so, we can have for so many reasons an in-person meeting. Um, I wanna talk about the Environmental Protection Fund and tell you a little bit about the centers. So we're pleased to report that in the past 15 years with the strong support from the Just Green Partners and the New York State Breast Cancer Network, Environmental Advocates, Clean and Healthy New York, Assemblyman Steve Engelbright and Bob Sweeney, Richard Gottfried and our governor, Andrew Cuomo, we were able to support in 2018 funding for seven clinical centers across New York State, focusing on the health of our most vulnerable population, our children. This funding has, made, has been made available through the Environmental Protection Fund. With New York State Department of Health assigned as the oversight um, and responsibility for us, and we're under the watchful eye of our visionary leader, Dr. Philip Landrigan, these seven centers are located in Western Buffalo, the Finger Lakes, Central New York, the Capital Region, Hudson Valley, New York City at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and our region on Long Island with Northwell Health and SUNY Stony Brook. Pediatricians, medical professionals, community partners have been working as a team, sharing expertise and experiences with integrity and transparency while we promote public policy and programs that serve diverse communities. The central mission of NiceCheck is to address health disparities through data-driven outcomes and education. And we know that we're very happy that these centers exist and how valuable is it during this pandemic. With the foundation of our work based upon social equity, partnerships, transparency, we developed a bi-directional approach to patient care, more emphasis and resources for primary prevention, and we're proactive in our understanding of the social determinants of health, and most importantly, a preparedness to deal with what we know will be challenging for all our children's health in future years. A member of our team, Dr. Al Justice Jordan, reminds us of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. Of all forms of inequity, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. And as we navigate through this health crisis, and we will, we're often reminded, we don't wanna go back to the world as it was. Together as an iron triangle of medical professionals, community and elected officials, we can create a huge paradigm shift in health. And we can treat each other better. And we need to treat the planet better. That connection between the environmental, that the environment and health is really very big now. NYSHEC is here for New Yorkers to protect children and families from crisis by promoting optimal and equitable health. And we'd like to work with you on strengthening and expanding our approach. I now know that the illness we face now usually occurred during a full life course and perhaps started in the womb when we are most vulnerable during our developing years. As a woman diagnosed with breast cancer in the 1980s, I experienced a top-down approach to treat and understand my cancer. We need to flip that around, Senator, by supporting a bottom-up approach to healthcare. And our high technology capacity can actually take us there easily. But it's the old mindset that's more challenging, that top-down approach. NYCHEC provides the foundation for that change, and we wanna work with you to further that, that direction. For all the attendees today, go to our website, nycheck.org, and get more details about the seven outstanding centers and their particular expertise. In 2018, we've educated 16,000 individuals, through ECHO and eScreener programs, we're able to navigate a broad range of early environmental influences in childcare and development. We provided 3,000 clinical consultations, taught 5,000 healthcare professionals about the environment and health and that strong connection, and trained 100 of the next generation of healthcare students. Karen, thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, do you have a Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so I I. You're a powerhouse um, here on Long Island and across New York State. 
we've been hearing your name everywhere doing great things. I think, you know, everybody is agreed that within a short period of time at the Senate, you've pushed so many environmental health issues. So how do you feel about the silos that are really, that uh, originally existed in looking at environment and not really connecting it to health? And um, how do you feel about the most vulnerable in our population, our children? Um, and how are we going to bring a more proactive um, approach um, now that we are seeing when we don't have preparedness, um, how are we going to bring this into a primary prevention? Because I think that if people are more prepared and they are engaged and educated, um, uh, they'll be able to make the right choices for themselves and be a better healthcare consumer. What are your feelings on that? Uh, well, I certainly, I appreciate the comments. I, I think the, uh, at this point in time, know there's a tremendous overlap between the environment and health. Um, and that um, the two are, are intimately connected. I think we see that in, you know, things that are obvious to us that we try to do our best working on things like asthma and air quality. Uh, you know, within our climate change bill, we want, you know, we will, air quality is a central part of that in registering who could be in an environmental justice community and impacts that would have. Um, we try to interlay some of that within the Environmental Bond Act itself. Uh, so there's there's no doubt. I mean, we're seeing that right now in the pandemic that environmental factors definitely play a role in, in who are victims and who may not be as readily. Um, so it's something that we're, we're looking very closely on. Of course, you, you are at the preeminent intersection of that, which is living on Long Island with breast cancer. Um, you know, we've been talking since the 80s about environmental factors uh, being involved in that. So, of course, they're connected. We, ha we have to look at, you know, look deeper and do better in, in putting those things together and breaking down those silos. And, you know, hopefully what one of these things this pandemic can do will we'll break a lot of old, old institutions down and old ways of thinking down and bring some new creative, important thinking in so we could uh, get the best information out there and make, and make innovative, good decisions, you know, in, in a different light. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to share our ideas with you in the near future and uh, bring your ideas forward. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, that is the time that we have for this panel. So I just want to stop, pause here and uh, thank you, Senator Kaminsky, for um, taking the time to talk with us. Um, and uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Can, um, can I just end with a quick, a quick thing? I, yeah. I you know, Look, no, normally we would all be in the Capitol today with the big Earth Day legislative package. Fortunately, we can't be. We're confronting more dire circumstances. But I, I'm really, uh, I think we all know that we've got a great Senate leader and Andrea Stewart-Cousins who's committed to continuing to push the envelope to bring real change to our planet and to put forward good ideas, whether they be difficult or not. I think the CLCPA is the best example of doing things that people said couldn't be done, overcoming a lot of odds, bringing a lot of different people together to do that. The second we're able to, we're going to continue to do that. There's so many good ideas on the table, so many good things that, that need work, whether it's in the solid waste sphere, whether it's on clean water, whether it's in, uh, you know, products for, other, you know, different products for children, or whether it's in continuing the efforts against climate change. There's so much to do, and I look forward to getting back and doing it sooner rather than later. Great, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, and thank you to our panelists. And um, I'm just gonna give you guys a couple of housekeeping notes as we transition um, between uh, this panel and the next, because um, it's not unusual to, to lose a little bit of time on these events, but I think we've been done, doing a pretty good job of staying on track. We're gonna run a little bit over uh, 12, uh, 2.30 for folks who are able to stay so that our last panel uh, can have time. Uh, to do that. So while we're bringing in our new panel, I just want to remind folks that if you want to get the letter that we uh, are sharing with our elected leaders, um, uh, if you want to view videos like the, the two that we clips that we've played, we have many more um, 20 total videos of short interviews between uh, elected officials uh, and advocates and some uh, other luminaries in our field. Um, if you want to check out the news release from today's event, um, and if you want to come back later once this recording is posted and uh, see what we're doing, uh, you can go to the link that I'll post in the um, in the chat, but it is uh, just-green.org 
slash ed50. Um, and then, uh, so as soon as I see everyone is here, um, I'm going to just briefly now introduce you to our last panel of the day, last but definitely not least. Um, we are um, so lucky to have joining us today, Assemblyman Steve Engelbright, who is the chair of the Environmental Conservation for the Assembly. And um, speaking with him, we'll have Robin Dropkin, Executive Director of Parks and Trails New York. Kate Carrera, Deputy Director of Environmental Advocates of New York, and Ann Reynolds, Executive Director of the Alliance for Clean Energy New York. And so with that, I'm gonna turn off my uh, camera and let you all take it away. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Bobby. Um, can everyone hear? Great. Oh. Hello, uh, Chair Engelbright. So um, great to see you uh, virtually um, and um, happy Earth Day. Um, I just, we're here today to get some thoughts from you from our, this great panel um, between Ann and uh, Robin and myself, um, some reflections and some points about our, you know, specific, um, what we're coming, what we've come here today to talk about um, in terms of uh, the commitments made into the uh, Bond Act, um, the EPF, and water infrastructure funding. Um, we want to thank you for being such a champion to the environment, um, always, and of course, your leadership and championship um, in this particular uh, challenging um, time with the with the budget. And we're really, really grateful. And um, with that, I might turn it over to Anne. Um, she's want has some questions for you about the Bond Act. Hello, Assemblyman Engelbright and everyone else. It's very good to see you. Um, at first, I cannot uh, start asking my question without a thank you for your support for the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth Act and, Com and Community Benefit Act, which was included in the budget this year. Uh, not the major topic of conversation for today, um, but absolutely appreciate you understanding that if we're gonna make progress on renewable electricity goals, we have to be able to build renewable electricity projects, wind and solar projects in a timely way. So we appreciate that. Um, but I wanted to, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, part of the people who worked so hard to get the Bond Act passed because I was working on the, <laughs> the other one. Um, but of course I noticed that it includes a good amount of money for climate change mitigation, um, which included in there is, um, air pollution projects in disadvantaged communities, energy efficiency and green building and renewable electricity projects. But it's, it's not um, any more specific than that. Uh, and I was wondering your thoughts on it. What do you think that funding should or could be spent on? And you have to make sure you're unmuted. Oh. There you go. There we go. Right. Uh, we have uh, budgeted uh, in the Bond Act about $700 million for these uh, uh, climate change mitigation uh, initiatives. Uh, one of the, the initiatives that uh, I just want to point out uh, in answer to your question that I think is particularly significant is uh, the goal of uh, moving for energy efficiency and renewable energy sourcing for state buildings, and uh, in particular buildings in the SUNY and CUNY system, uh, those buildings account for 40% uh, of all of the state buildings. And it makes sense for the state to uh, lead by example with its own buildings and uh, to use the Bond Act to uh, reduce the cost to the taxpayers uh, over time and uh, to show that this is a very doable uh, uh, direction for us to go in. Uh, so uh, uh, I just want to mention how uh, uh, significant I think this part of, of the proposed Bond Act is. Thank you so much. I, I love the idea of renewable energy on school buildings of any type because then it can be part of the education program too. And I think I am turning it over to Robin Dropkin for the next question, I believe. Um, I am unmuted. Okay. Hello, Assemblyman. How are you? Hi, Robin. How are you? 
Good, nice to see you, if only virtually. And um, everybody else who's on this um, Earth Day virtual advocacy day. So today, as we all know, is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, but you, what you probably don't know is that it's the 27th anniversary of the um, Environmental Protection Fund. So I would not have thought it's been around that long, but it has. And that's a lot of years of investment in the environment and also investment in the economy and in jobs. Uh, we've had a lot of success with it. And this year's budget continues the investment of uh, at 300 million, which is fantastic. And I wanna extend a huge thank you to you assemblymen and to your colleagues for, for making that happen in a very tough budget year. And of course we know things have gotten even a lot tougher. And um, I'm interested in your thoughts about how the Environmental Protection Fund can get us on the road to recovery, like what aspects of it will really help us in doing that. We all know we have a long road ahead of us. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, the um, first thing I just want to mention in this regard is uh, the ZBGA program, the Zoo Botanical Gardens and Aquariums program, uh, which uh, in recent years has uh, become uh, one of the main features of uh, the Environmental Protection Fund. It didn't used to be a part of that. It was separately funded in prior years, uh, but it's appropriate and it has a, a dramatic impact on uh, a, a number of important variables. One is uh, that it is through our uh, zoological and botanical uh, uh, organizations are not-for-profit organizations, which themselves comprise, uh, for all practical purposes, a parallel park system to our own state park system, um, that they, to a very large extent, are uh, the teaching mechanism for the next generation um, and the stewardship of all of our open spaces and the environment in, in general um, for school children, to a very large extent, is enabled through the ZBGA program. Uh, we restored it during the budget process to $16 million, and uh, it will have a dramatic uh, economic impact. It's estimated that the um, uh, benefit uh, of uh, just uh, some of the New York City uh, organizations, such as the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Bronx Zoo, and the New York Aquarium, will spin off. $430 million uh, uh, of activity and create over 2,600 jobs. So uh, I just wanna underscore this is an example of the kind of benefits that the Environmental Protection Fund as a capital program uh, generates uh, because it is indeed an investment. It's not an expenditure, it's an investment and it spins off economic benefits uh, in the short term and uh, the support of the next generation for environmental programs of all kinds uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I love the concept of the parallel park system and I think it's very apt. And I think we all understand that the animals and the fish need to be fed no matter what else is happening. So um, we really appreciate your support to that, for that. So do you give any other thoughts about, you know, in a larger context, how the investment in the EPF um, might help us out of this predicament we're in? Well, I, I think that the, let, let, me, let me shift for a moment to, to the Bond Act, if I could. Um, there are some important aspects of uh, open space acquisition and land acquisition that are built into the proposed Bond Act at uh, the level of about $550 million, which includes funds that will enable some important new state parks, the uh, proposed state park in the Kingston area on the Hudson River uh, will be enabled uh, through the passage of this Bond Act, for example. Um, and and uh, other uh, state park uh, related uh, acquisitions and uh, improvements. So uh, I, I, I think it's important that 
as we go forward uh, into this uncertain time uh, that we remember that making investments into uh, the environment uh, is something that not only we as advocates uh, and legislators uh, need to work on, but that we need to carry that message to our general public and ask them in one coherent voice to support the Bond Act as, as uh, I anticipate the governor is going to uh, enable it to be on the ballot. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'll turn it over to Katie now. Yep, great. Thank you so much. And I think that's such an important point um, that the assembly member um, has made that actually all the things that we're talking about here today, the Bond Act, um, the EPF, and the question I'm going to have for you in terms of water infrastructure are all huge economic um, drivers. And it, and it just highlights the connection between building a green and sustainable environment really benefits the economy. And that connection often is, um, I think, not made strong enough, but it, we're living in a we're living in a moment in time where that is absolutely true. So, um, you know, I think it's so relevant that we're talking about that here today. I wanted to just ask a question about the water infrastructure um, funding. We've heard uh, Jeremy and some and Liz in earlier in the webinar talk a bit about that program, which is a phenomenal program that's had a lot of successes. So, you know, thank you again for your leadership um, in securing the five hundred new uh, the new five hundred million dollars for that program this year. Um, that program goes to a very important upgrades to aging water infrastructure across the state, as well um, you know, as money towards the lead uh, service line replacement program um, and going to uh, help us deal with um, emerging contaminants that the, new, the, the water authorities will need to treat um, as we start, um, as we, when the state finally finalizes uh, the maximum contaminant levels for new contaminants. Um, you may know or be aware that EA um, published a report last year which talked about a called untapped potential, which talked about um, the projects, the money and the grants that are going through the water infrastructure program. And what we found in that report is that the EFC is doing a great job at getting the money out the door and funding the projects, which is a fabulous, um, you know, uh, result to, 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 to find. But what we also found is that nearly half Half of those jobs that are shovel ready, the applications have been made and every, the grants and everything has been said to the EFC, they just don't have the money to put the new pro shovel ready, ready projects out the door. So what I wanted to ask you is how would you like to see these water infrastructure funds um, distributed and what, and what is being done to get the money out the door quicker? Uh, first, the question of, uh, of uh, the administration of, uh, of the program. Uh, that's not a legislative uh, responsibility, although we watch it closely um, and uh, uh, generally are, are, are satisfied that, uh, uh, as you rightly indicate, that the money is uh, uh, moving out uh, and uh, uh, becoming available. Uh, nevertheless, it, the, uh, the uncertainties created by uh, the quagmire uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, realities are, are normally difficult uh, with, with uh, a state that is the size of a nation, such as New York. Uh, and that's compounded uh, now by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I think, uh, we're going to have to make sure that we have additional staffing uh, requested by the DEC. They're down uh, one third. Um, and uh, clearly uh, they need uh, to have some additional staffing. And I, I'm hoping that the commissioner and, and the governor uh, support uh, that uh, in uh, the next budget uh, because uh, we can't actually execute this important pro uh, program in the way that it needs to be unless we have adequate staffing at the state level uh, to um, make sure that the municipal projects and the cleanup of our water bodies um, uh, are followed through on. Um, clearly, uh, this is a program also that gives us a chance to deal with 
the whole realm of emerging contaminants, the PFOA, the PFOS, um, are, are perhaps just the beginning of what we're going to see going forward. We need to identify and remediate emerging contaminants. And this program uh, is, is ready made for that. And uh, I think uh, also it's important that I mention that I am so very pleased uh, that uh, Speaker Carl Hasty has uh, supported this program and indeed almost all of the environmental programs uh, of, of the assembly uh, have his strong support and uh, the strong support of a majority of my colleagues. And I just want to say thank you to the speaker and to my colleagues for uh, standing behind these programs uh, and especially during the budget process. Great, thank you so much. I think Bobby, we're close to time, or if we have any more time. Yes, hi, thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Assemblyman, for joining us. Um, I think we, we are at the, top, at the close of our um, time here, and um, I think we're gonna just wrap things up. Um, we will be taking all of the questions that folks have asked and, and sharing them with all of our speakers today. But I just wanna thank you, Assemblyman Engelbright, for joining us and having this conversation, and also thank all of our panelists and speakers throughout the afternoon. And thank you to all of you who came and uh, tuned in. We really appreciate having um, this opportunity to come together, uh, even though it's uh, each from our own homes. So um, just wanna wrap up with a couple more um, uh, just notes. Um, we are, um, again, uh, making all of this material available at just-green.org slash ed50. So you can go get all of the information, watch all those videos, um, please share them. Um, uh, again, we really want to uh, uh, get spread the word, and, and as we are here with the, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we really look forward to how we can uh, collaborate and continue to fight for uh, a healthy environment going forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone, um, and we will be making this webinar available online for folks to view later. And I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your Earth Day. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.